Okay, uh, hello, and uh, this is joint work with a group of several authors. Um, it's the product of uh, a long-standing series of meetings and collaborations with Chris Beck, uh, Maria Fox and myself, and Peter Gregory, who was uh, working with us uh, before we recently all scattered to the four winds. Okay, so uh, those of you who know anything about sat or follow the work that's going on in the sat community can't have missed the uh, one of the most recent areas hot topics in the sat community which is this this idea called sat modulo theories but for those who haven't met it i thought i'd just explain briefly what it is so obviously i'm expecting most of you to be familiar with the idea of a sat problem we're given a propositional formula and we're asked to find evaluation that makes that formula true or to answer the question is there such evaluation uh, in SAT modulo theories, the instance is now a formula over a first order theory, or possibly multiple theories, but for the moment let's assume one theory. And we're given uh, that theory and a particular module effectively for evaluating satisfiability over that specific theory. And the question that we're now asked is, is there evaluation that makes our formula true subject to the constraints that that theory defines for those symbols that represent the theory. Okay, and this, this idea has been around for quite a while. There are quite a lot of solvers. The, the area is quite exciting. There's uh, one paper there, which is, is not the first paper in the area, but is one of the comprehensive overviews of what's been going on in the field. Okay, so just to give a very simple example, uh, with a SAT formula, we might have a simple collection of literals, A, B, C, which are then connected in this, this formula and we're asked to find evaluation for it. In SAT modulo theories, those literals are now replaced by sentences, in this case very simple sentences, from an underlying theory, some specific theory. In this case a theory of arithmetic, but it could be a theory of, of well, a whole range of different things have been explored. And we'll talk a little bit about the kinds of theories we might be interested in in a while, but for the moment let's, let's consider arithmetic. The way that a solver typically works for these problems is that there is a core solver, which is, in the case of SMT, usually a DPLL-based solver, searching over possible assignments to the propositional variables, and then it communicates with the theory module, or modules if there are multiple theories that are involved, asking for satisfiability of the conjunctions of literals that come from the specific theories involved in those, those expressions. And those submodules will respond at least with yes or no. Are they satisfiable or not satisfiable? But in fact, in, in uh, the most successful solvers, what you're really interested in is also getting some information back from the solver to explain why a particular conjunction is not satisfiable. And that probably is in the form of no good, but we'll talk about that again a little later. So this idea has been very promising, very exciting in the uh, SAT community because it has allowed the extension of SAT solvers to a whole range of new uh, domains and new problems. And we were thinking that maybe the same idea could be exploited in the planning community. So the idea is that classical planning also restricts to propositional formulae for the preconditions and propositional, sentence, uh, propositional assignments for the effects. Notice. I'm going to talk about variables quite a lot, assignments to variables. When I talk about variables, I'm not talking about parameters, sometimes that we, we call parameters of actions variables, but I'm talking about the, the fluence, the things that are actually assigned value. So those are what I mean when I'm going to talk about variables. So these are the grounded literals of our planning problem. And those will, in a propositional planning problem, have the value true or false in any given state. So evaluation is going to be an assigned true or false to each of those grounded literals. And the planning problem, well, you, you will know what the planning problem is. When we move to PMT, the idea with PMT is that those formulae that form the preconditions of the actions can now be formulae over symbols from some theory, possibly multiple theories. And we also have assignment in the effect of those actions that allows us to assign values from the appropriate types for those theories two variables of those corresponding types. So we might have types 
of integer, for example, and so we can assign to variables that correspond to integer. And in fact, that is a familiar idea in, in planning with numbers, because that's the way that the uh, numeric versions of PDDL domains work. OK, so let's have a look at an example. This is a classical encoding of a problem that might otherwise more naturally have been encoded using numbers. This uses fuel levels, and it's using symbols to represent the possible integer values of the fuel levels of a vehicle. And we have these complex preconditions that are just intended to make sure that you step up or down the values of the uh, variables correctly. If we re-encode that as a PMT encoding, so we now assume that our variables can include uh, sentences over, over these uh, numeric value variables, we end up with a precondition, which is uh, an arithmetic sentence, and we also have assignments to arithmetic variables. And in this case, we've also got an assignment to an enumerated type variable, a variable that has multiple finite, finite many multiple values. That's, that's pretty familiar because that is actually essentially the proposal that uh, Malta came up with for SAS plus representation. But we might extend beyond that and start talking about more interesting types than the ones that we've already met before. So here, for example, is an operator that allows us to transfer the contents of one truck into another where the contents of trucks are represented by sets of objects. And here what we do is to say, provided that the two vehicles are at the same location, so those two variables, at t1 and at t2, have the same value, then the effect of the action is to assign to the set-valued variable the contents of t1, the empty set, since that's now empty, and to assign to the content variable in t2 the union of the original contents of the two uh, trucks. Now, that's, that's a more interesting example of what we might be able to do with PMT because it introduces a much more rich and structured type than the types that we're familiar with. OK, so how do we start building models for problems in PMT? Well, much as we do in SMT, we start with uh, a description of a domain built over these theories. Our uh, theories are going to have to attach to our domain description through some signature that allows us to exploit the link between our solver and those modules that support the theories. So there are, there are specific interfaces that must be met by the supporting modules. In particular, they have to provide an evaluation function and satisfaction tester for expressions and literals and sentences over the, uh, over the signatures of those types that they're uh, dealing with. This, this idea of extending strips with uh, a theory-based a, a theory modular structure is, is not an entirely new idea. Lots of people have thought about it in various ways. I think that one, one of the contributions that we're making here is to tie it more explicitly to the SMT work and to, and to normalize and regularize the way in which those theories can be exploited. OK, so if we have a representation of a domain in planning modulo theories language, how can we go about solving such a problem? One, one way that's fairly straightforward to imagine doing at least is to translate our planning modulo theories uh, domain description and problem instance into a SAT modulo theories problem. And you'd start with planning to SAT as your standard uh, starting point, and then you just rely on the fact that SMT solvers have the provision to understand the theories that you're exploiting in your planning modulo theories and simply convey the, the uh, statements, the sentences from your planning modulo theories description straight into your SAT modulo theories encoding. And then you rely on a SAT modulo theories solver to solve your planning problem and uh, everything's great except that unfortunately performance turns out not to be so good so we tried this this is some of the example results that we got so the first collection of problems those first uh, half a dozen problems or so are problems from benchmark domains integer uh, or numeric problems at least uh, you can see that for comparison metric ff is able to solve those in well under a second, so these are not difficult problems for metric FF, but they turn out to be hard problems for the SMT solvers. In this case, this was Z3. I can't claim that I know for sure whether Z3 is a particularly strong solver, but at least it's competitive. Some more interesting results that come out of it. Unfortunately, the, the, the timings are not great. I mean, we're still taking quite a lot of time for relatively small plans, but this begins to show us how the expressive power of planning modulo theories could become interesting. 
These are problems that involve manipulating arrays. And you can encode those problems in PDDL, but not naturally. These are problems that are encoded directly as natural encodings, signing values to arrays, and reading values from arrays, allowing us to swap those values around or reverse segments of arrays. And it's, it's very easy to encode the problem, not so well solved by conversion to SMT. So the alternative, the second alternative, and the one that we explored after that first collection of work, is to actually try building a planner that can work directly with the PMT encoding. And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about next. So the idea that we looked at, first of all, was to extend the HMAX heuristic. We decided that the HMAX heuristic is the easiest one to start working with. Uh, essentially, let's, let's remember that the HMAX heuristic can be seen as effectively computing the length of the shortest parallel plan in a relaxed state space for the problem that we're trying to solve. Okay? That's, that's one way to think of what HMAX is computing. And one way to think about the relaxation that we're using there is the standard way that we often talk about of ignoring delete effects. But what I would like to show you now is a slightly different way of interpreting the same idea that allows us to then generalize it to other types. Okay, so we start with an initial state, which remember will be evaluation over the variables that describe the state of our problem. And for a propositional planning problem, that will be simply Boolean variables, propositional variables. So we have an assignment. Some of those variables are true, some of them are false. That's our initial valuation. We identify the actions whose preconditions are satisfiable in that initial state, and we then apply them. Now remember that in relaxed reachability, what we do is where an action has an add effect that assigns the variable true, we effectively accumulate that true value along with all of the other variables that had already been assigned true. We don't remove variables that have been deleted. However, we could, in fact, imagine that what we're doing when we ignore deletes is effectively adding the false value to variables that were already assigned true, so that now they can take either the true or the false value, and observing for computational efficiency that if the preconditions of all of our actions contain no negative precondition literals, then actually we can ignore those false assignments for efficiency. But an alternative view is to say, well, actually what we do is evaluate the sentences that represent the preconditions of our actions in a valuation that has abstracted from the underlying idea that all of the variables are Boolean values to one in which the variables could take three values, true, false, or this compound, true or false value. And in that case, you have to relax the interpretation of the uh, way in which you check the preconditions of an action. So you use an abstract interpretation of your logical connectives in order to decide whether an action is applicable. And the assignments accumulate in the variable domains, and the key idea here is that the relaxation, instead of seeing it as ignore delete effects, we see it as we're looking to see whether a precondition is satisfiable in some assignment from this, this valuation set. Or equivalently, we're looking at an abstract interpretation of the logical connectives with respect to this abstracted domain representation. Okay, so I'm going to try and formalize that a little bit. I'm not going to try to do it as quite as tightly as the paper does it, but nevertheless, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that idea. So the idea is that for each variable, we have a domain, and for that domain, we have an associated domain abstraction. So this is the abstract interpretation domain. It's not an abstraction in the sense that we're going to collapse values. It's an abstraction in the, in the, in the same way that uh, in type theory, people use abstract interpretations to do type checking. So it's an abstract interpretation of the values that we're going to be using in that domain of value. And each value is mapped to, uh, each value in the original domain is mapped to at least some value in the abstraction domain uh, by an abstract interpretation function. So we say what is the corresponding value there. And then in the abstracted domain, for any given type, we have to give an abstract interpretation of all of the symbols that the theory supports. So uh, we can then build an abstracted reachability graph by exploiting this abstracted interpretation by asking which actions have their preconditions satisfied under that abstract interpretation. And that allows us to build this reachability analysis. And to try to make that a little more concrete, let's, let's reinterpret what metric FF does in this light. Okay? So what metric FF does is to, for numeric variables, propositional variables, 
I think everybody understands exactly what is happening with those, but let's focus on the numeric variables. Numeric variables, the abstract interpretation of the values for those uh, numeric variables is going to be real valued intervals. Okay, that's, that's the abstract interpretation. And predicates like less than and functions such as plus now have an abstract interpretation and we have to achieve a relaxation in that process. And I won't go through the details of that, but I think you can see that it's straightforward to extend the interpretation of these functions and predicates to intervals. And then effects are implemented by whenever you assign a value to a numeric variable, you now extend the range of the interval so it includes that new value. That's, that's the way that the, inter the uh, assignment is interpreted. Okay, how, what, what other abstractions could we use for uh, looking at these abstract interpretations? Well, an obvious one is the power set of the domain of variables. So every time you extend the uh, range of reachable values, you just add them to the set that you're using. This is essentially what we're doing with propositional variables, but we could equally do it with uh, finite domain enumerated variables. Uh, and we can also do it with um, richer variables. Although, of course, depending on whether the power set is finite or not, it could, could work usefully or not. Um, and, and the details of the process of abstraction there. An alternative is that we can use a finite abstraction. And with a finite abstraction, essentially what we do is we take the power set, but we then chop out a finite subset of that and simply say, I'm only interested in elements from this finite subset. And, and we call that the basis for that finite abstraction. And we could couple that with a, a special value which we could call top, which effectively says, if you ever go outside this finite range, then assume that you've got everything. And that means that you can effectively achieve whatever precondition you need to satisfy for this particular uh, domain. Choosing a basis is, is quite interesting, and I'm not going to have time to talk about that in detail here, but I'm just going to mention that in the paper we describe a probing technique that allows us to identify a useful subset of an infinite type that we could use as a finite basis for doing these finite enumerated abstractions. And that allows us then to manipulate types that are interesting structured infinite types, uh, including lists, sets, multisets, and so on. Uh, and if we remove top from this, we end up with an inadmissible heuristic, but uh, it also is typically slightly more informed. So there are benefits and costs to exploiting the idea of using a top or not. Okay, so we implemented it, we tested it. I've, I've got some data here for a few interesting domains. First domain is one that's familiar, the jugs and water domain. This allows us to compare existing uh, numeric based planners with PMT plan, which is using this, this idea that I've just described. Uh, we've got domains that involve sets. Those can't easily be expressed in PDDL. Depending on the specific problem and the specific domain, there are tricks that you can use to get around the fact that there really are sets in there and try to encode it mechanistically. I've got some data that shows what happens if you do that for a particular domain, in this case, the storyteller's domain, so dump trucks, you, you carry around objects in sets and you can dump them all as sets. With storytellers, the idea is that a storyteller, a group of storytellers, travel around telling their stories to their audiences and their audiences accumulate stories in sets and you're interested in trying to work out how long it would take before everybody knows all the stories. And the multi-sets uh, encoding of airport uses the multi-set to encode the sets of locations that are blocked by an aircraft that's moving uh, around through the location. Okay, so here is uh, some data for uh, jugs and water, and what you see here is a comparison between PMT plan, which is the, the blue line going across basically horizontally, and metric FF solving these same problems, which you can see is, is blowing up exponentially there. This is a, a logarithmic scale graph. Um, these, the numbers across the uh, x-axis here are the numbers of different size jugs. So we're scaling a, possibly an artificial variable, but you're seeing a, an interesting effect in that problem. PMT plan in these graphs is using the HMAX heuristic, so it's not as informed as HFF, uh, with the finite enumerated base um, set abstraction heuristic. Okay? That's. And here's the storytelling domain, and again this comparison is, is slightly 
Odd in the sense that PMT plan is using the same domain encoding for all of these problems, which are scaling with numbers of stories in the problem that have to be solved and storytellers in the problems that have to be solved. Uh, metric FF requires a re-encoding of the, of the domain for each of these problem instances. So this, this comparison requires a new encoding. We've, we've tried to encode this as well as we possibly can to get reasonable performance. And you see that where the line gives up, that's where metric FF stops being able to solve these problem instances. Okay, so to finish up, what, what is the next step? Well, there are lots of interesting types that we can apply this idea to. Uh, so one of the types that we're interested in is robot configurations, and that, work, that, that idea and the first steps that we've made in that work reminds me very much of the work that uh, Wheeler and his students uh, showed us earlier this afternoon. Uh, we've been looking at applications of the idea in uh, management of grids, smart grids, voltages and power flows and circuits, computing things. Uh, and angles for trig functions and so on. Um, we, we would like to exploit a better heuristic than HMAX by using slightly more informed variants. One of the challenges in doing that is that it's very difficult to uh, ass assign responsibility for extension of a particular domain in this, this representation. But we think that we might have ways to do that, so we're beginning to look at it. One of the key aspects of SMT is the way that the communication of no goods comes back from subsolvers and you'll see here that we haven't got any propagation from subsolvers. The information we're getting is purely in the extension of the reachable set of uh, uh, constants as we move forward through the reachability analysis. So we're hoping to exploit more ideas about no goods and, and more communication back from subsolvers. So there's, there's still work in progress there. And obviously, we'd like to extend the ideas to temporal planning. So we're interested in integrating these ideas with our temporal work in Crikey and PMT. Oh, uh, sorry, pop -air. And I'll stop there. So we have time for a few questions. Yes. You. That's very useful. Sorry, looked at what? So that, that's a, an interesting example, and I, I think absolutely reasoning over ontologies, reasoning with axioms. I think that axioms can be absorbed into this idea derived predicate. Um, and in fact, if you look at the paper, ontologies is one of the things we explicitly indicate we think fits into this framework. So, yeah, absolutely. So, it's, uh, it's been the experience that lots of uh, more uh, challenging uh, formalisms can be compiled to a classical planning. Now, I, I'm assuming this is not the case here, but have you tried looking at some fragments that might be compiled to classical planning, maybe? So I, I think that the biggest problem here is that you can't anticipate exactly which constants you're going to need in the problem. You, you aren't given them as part of your initial problem specification, and you're talking about infinite types. So the real challenge is how do you identify how many and which constants you're going to need as you build your plan? And uh, of course, in, in principle, even using, I mean, certainly using the finite basis uh, reachability analysis that we're doing here, we're not finding optimal plans because we're eliminating constants that would actually make the plans more efficient by perhaps visiting a value and coming back that, that currently isn't available to us. So I think that it's, I mean, it's an interesting question whether you can do the compilation. I think the compilation to SMT is probably the most effective that we could hope to do here, but the jury's out, I guess. Okay, other, other questions? So, so I have one short. So, based on experience, is it hard to modify the SMT solvers? For example, we have uh, STP algorithms for solving simple temporal problems that might be useful for these applications. Is it easy to add some STP algorithm to SMT solver? So, the interface that you have to meet in order to add things to this uh, 
structure is, is very straightforward. I mean, we added multiple types and students have done that. So I think that it's, it's reasonably straightforward to populate the interface that we have to provide in order to extend to new types. Um, so I guess that answers that. So do I. So, John, no more questions? Thank you. So, we can move to the second talk, which will be given by Lee McCluskey about optimizing plans for analysis of action dependencies and interdependencies. And I will not. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Well, I'm pleased to, uh, to hear that the people in the uh, path planning track have quietened down. Um, and I'm disappointed to not, to not hear the same kind of passion uh, in, in, in this audience here. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Put some music on. Um, so so this, this work is, 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 is uh, really led by Lukasz Gropa, um, who's working with us at Huddersfield. Um, and um, uh, in fact, when I agreed to, give the, to, to present um, I was talking to Brian about what we were going to do about short papers, and I said, oh, of course, we'll just have posters, and he said, no, you've got to talk. So here I am giving the talk, and uh, this is a short paper. Um, it's kind of, so it's, it's ongoing work, uh, it's, it's sort of in its infancy, and, uh, but I think it's very, very uh, interesting. Certainly not, um, not unique, so there's lots, been lots of work uh, in the area of um, trying to uh, optimize uh, plans and, and, and in, certainly in the, uh, the post-planning phase, which this is about. So it's, it's part, I, I see it, so how does it fit in, I mean I'm sort of more a machine learning and knowledge engineering person, I see it fitting in in terms of um, being part of a toolbox of components that you might get out when you, you, you get hold of a, 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 a out-of-the-box planner, a, 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 a fast um, domain independent planning engine and you put it into a component in your application and you may think well this is going to give us some plans very fast but they may well be uh, very suboptimal so we need a component after it to, to try and uh, to make those plans uh, a bit more optimal uh, and it kind of fits in also with other work that we're doing um, which we're presenting at ECI which is again a similar kind of idea where you take uh, is a domain independent kind of work where you take a, a domain model and you try to reformulate it in that case to make whatever planning engine you've got uh, hopefully speed up. So it's, it's, it's sort of domain, to, to some degree the techniques are domain independent and can be slotted in with uh, planning engines. Uh, of course, um, Patrick, Patrick's talk this morning when he was, he was kind of addressing this, this similar idea um, uh, and if he succeeds with it I guess you could say that um, you don't need this kind of component, but uh, we're never going to get to optimal planners um, in, in, in um, non-exponential time, I guess. So the basic idea of this work, anyway, is um, satisfied planners, fast planners, tend to give um, non-optimal plans. Uh, and in fact, that's just part of the story. Some of the speed-up techniques, like using macro operators, give even worse, um, tend to give even worse nice plans. So there's, there's, there's a lot of scope in there to try and um, post-process the plan and um, make it more optimal, in our case, just to make it uh, shorter. And this work really concentrates on trying to do that, as I said a little bit earlier, in a kind of domain-independent fashion. So sort of to look at uh, operators uh, on the fly, or actions on the fly, and see where we've got um, uh, inverses and see where we've got... Uh, actions which uh, action sequences which can be replaced by um, smaller sequences or just just indeed one action so this work um, initial work really is, uh, has, has uh, assumptions that we're just assuming that we're working in strips and um, we have a, a linear sequence of um, actions as, as the plan and as I said we're looking to create really kind of domain independent methods um, and, and, and this work focuses in on really inverses where you find uh, uh, two actions, the one which is the inverse of, of another and you also, uh, we also focus in on replaceability 
So where you find two actions where in fact uh, they, the sequence of those actions uh, could be replaced by uh, a single action. So ways to uh, shorten or optimize uh, the plan. So here's some very simple examples. So you might have uh, a stack uh, A on B at some part of the plan, and at another part you might have unstack. It's potentially possible that those two uh, are redundant and you can take them out and you've still got a solution to the original uh, planning problem. Or again, you might have uh, two actions like I to X, from X to Y, a drive from Y to Z later on, and you might be able to um, replace those uh, with drive from X uh, to, to, to Z. There are, of course, a lot of complex situations where um, you may have sequences where these things are interleaved, so you might pick up A and stack A and B, A on B, and then have some more operators which may be dependent on that. So pick up C, for example, uh, the uh, precondition of hand empty is in fact um, um, uh, achieved by stacking A on B. So uh, it's not so easy to see that you can actually uh, get rid of the stack A on B and the st unstack A on B because the stack um, is actually achieving the precondition of some operator in between. So there's, there's lots of, of different uh, examples and it, get, it can get quite complicated. So I'm going to take you back uh, through a few definitions to uh, as far back as uh, Chapman's uh, work on um, uh, partial order planners and causal link stuff, which you all remember very fondly. And I'm, I'm not going to ask everybody, do you know all about this stuff? I'm sure you do. I uh, probably learned it uh, um, in your AI class. So, so um, some, some, some uh, kind of similar type definitions. Um, we say basically a, AJ is directly dependent on AI if action AI is an achiever uh, for one of AJ's uh, preconditions. So there's no other, uh, we're assuming this is in a completed plan, uh, so there's no other action between those two that actually has P on its ad list. So a, 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 AI is the achiever, we say therefore that AJ is directly dependent on that. Um, and then when we take this direct idea of direct de dependence, we can then um, look at the transit of closure, and in that way we can see that AJ um, is in fact dependent on AK through uh, um, the fact that AI uh, achieves P and AK uh, achieves Q. Um, so there's a kind of transit of closure thing there. So um, we call that the a dependent. And given that, you can then make an observation that uh, a goal action, in other words, an, uh, a goal which is dressed up as an action, so all the goal um, propositions are actually preconditions, uh, we can say that um, a necessary condition for, a, for an optimal plan is that um, uh, AG, this, 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 the action which is in fact just the, uh, the goals, is in fact has to be dependent on every action. Right, so we can remove, we think about removing actions if, if, if AG is not dependent on a particular action, then that action is, is useless. It's, it's not doing anything um, in the plan. So that's a quick observation about the idea of um, the idea of, uh, of um, dependence. Then we look at one or two definitions uh, on independence. Now, independence is a very ambiguous word. It's been used in various areas of parallel planning and stuff. This is a specific. Um, definition that I found initially a, a little bit counterintuitive. So, so basically, you say that uh, that that that, that a, a, AI and AJ, where AJ is, uh, J is greater than I, are in fact independent. If three conditions hold, AI doesn't uh, achieve, or in fact, AJ is not dependent on AI. So there's none of its preconditions uh, depend on, on, on AI in the chain. That's one of the, another way of putting it is AI doesn't have a role in achieving AJ's preconditions. So that's one thing. Um, you also need that uh, AJ um, doesn't in fact uh, clobber any of AI's preconditions. And finally, um, a, a, AI doesn't clobber any of AJ's positive effects. So anything that AJ is going to um, uh, achieve further up the plan, uh, AI uh, couldn't possibly clobber that. 
So those three conditions give you, um, oh, give you independence. Um, and in fact, you can, it, it's a little bit more intuitive if um, you look at it from the point of view that assuming those two are adjacent, it means you can swap them around. So the main idea that there are others in getting this independence between uh, two uh, actions somewhere in a solution is that you can move them together, you, you can move, sorry, move actions together by swapping them around. So once you've got this independence, then in fact, one, if A, I and AJ were adjacent, we can swap them around and we still have a solution. Okay, and you can see that, um, you can see that down, down here in the, uh, the diagram. Uh, I won't go into it because Roman's just told me I'm going on too long. So um, the idea is to use this notion of independence between adjacent uh, actions in a solution plan and swap them around and two uh, actions in a solution plan which can be, can be swapped around so that the actions can be swapped around that, so that you can bring them both together we call weakly adjacent. So uh, in, in the algorithm, in fact, um, there's four ways to, to, to progress this. Uh, if you, those two black dots are um, actions in the solution plan, and if you want to try and get them together so that they're adjacent, and then you can do something with them, like maybe take them away from the solution plan if they're inverses. Um, the idea is that you keep swapping um, not uh, independent actions around until you get the two uh, next to each other, the two black dots next to each other. The main reason for doing that actually is, is if you spot the two black dots and they actually can be replaced by a single action. They're, they're both actions. So if, you have, if you've got two actions where you spot, you can actually replace it by a single one. Then you bring them together and, and then replace it. And uh, you've made the, uh, the plan a little bit shorter and you still have a solution to your original problem. So that's, that's the, uh, the, 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 the obvious definition of replaceability, where you're replacing an action or a sequence of actions A uh, by another action A dash, and clearly you want A dash its preconditions to be uh, the same or less than um, the other one. You want the effects, the negative effects to be the same or less than, and you want the positive effects to be greater than uh, or the same as the uh, actions, positive effects that you're, um, that you're uh, replacing. Um, okay, I'll have to speed up a little bit. So we have a proposition two where um, also we've kind of condensed the idea of this independence so that if we look at two actions in our solution plan which are mutually, uh, which are inverse, so in other words, AI followed by AJ basically gives you, always gives you the same state, so uh, AJ reverses the effect of AI, then they're, they're two things that we'd like to get rid of if we can. It may be that you can't get rid of them just because they're inverses in, in, in the solution plan doesn't mean that, that you can get rid of them. They may be there for something, uh, some reason. But in fact, if we have this set of conditions where um, there's no action between them such that AI uh, is a, an achiever for uh, that, that, that action in between, and AK's uh, delete list does not uh, uh, clobber any of, of, of what AJ is actually adding, then with those two conditions, we can actually remove AI and AJ if they're, if they, they're, they're inverse, if, J, if AJ is the inverse of AI. So that's a very sort of a neat way of, of uh, more efficient of just using the swapping technique of getting rid of two uh, actions from our solution plan. Speed up. So this is quickly, this is the algorithm. So um, the algorithm is implemented for the paper. I think Luke Ash has actually gone much further now on this, but it's, it's, it's ongoing work. Um, so you can remove all the actions that are not dependent on the goal. And then you can uh, iterate and remove pairs of inverse actions using proposition two, which I, I, I touched a little bit earlier. So that, again, makes the solution plan smaller. 
and then you can compute independencies, and that's probably the most computationally uh, hard one, so that's about order n squared. I mean, a lot of this is very, very low order stuff, so it should be very, very quick. Um, and, and then you can try and replace uh, um, act uh, sequences of actions with one action, and you have to iterate that, because if you replace stuff, or if you get rid of inverses, then you've got to look again to see whether you get can get rid of other um, operators. So very quickly, um, experiments then. Um, there's three here from the depots, gold miner, and storage. Uh, we used the planner LPG and an optimal planner, uh, Gamer, uh, to work out the optimal plans. And Gamer, um, the, the, the ones where the uh, green triangle is somewhere above the axis is where it actually came up with a solution. And depots, LPG seem to, um, seem to get good solutions, so the blue dots are the ones, the LPG plus this optimization technique, so that didn't help too much. In gold miner, um, the, the um, sorry, it's not the blue dots, the, the red ones are the ones that you want to watch, the red squares. So in, in gold miner, uh, we got a 16% improvement overall, so you can see the red squares there are considerably lower than the blue dots. So, so, that, so it actually uh, managed to, uh, to optimize uh, a lot more. And then the best um, results we got was through storage domain. And you can see that the, the red dots are considerably below, the red squares are considerably below the blue dots. So that, that improved the most. And we also tried it on two other ones as well. Um. <laughs> There's some related work, which I've got to skip through very quickly. Um, uh, from ICAPS and from Flares this year. Um, so just to conclude then, um, this is really ongoing stuff, so the results are very promising. We've managed in, in, in some domains to, to very quickly um, optimize, to, 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 to work towards the op optimal plan, obviously not get there. Um, and the, the sort of times that we're looking at are, are in the same order as the uh, initial times to generate the plan in the first place. Um, so you're not, you haven't got a, a, a big overhead in, in, uh, in extra time. Um, the particular features of this, it's analytical method, and it can, re re it can remove pairs from kind of anywhere in the plan, where recent work and, and uh, work in the past seems to just concentrate on looking at neighborhoods and removing sort of loops in plans, where this could take sort of inverses from anywhere in the plan and, and just remove them. So, so that, that's basically just what I'd say. We, we, we certainly have got a long way to go. So, um, difficult, the difficult um, examples where you have sort of nesting of inverses and things. This, uh, the initial algorithm shown in the paper, uh, doesn't cope with some of those. So, so that's all I want to say. Okay, sorry for going on too long. Thanks. Okay, so we still have time for questions. Do you have any mechanism for uh, moving the responsibility that you identify when you build those calls and links from one action to another as you start swapping actions in the, in the plan? Yeah, yeah, I mean the responsibility may well move because the, 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 the swap basically is proved to not affect the, uh, the fact that it's still a solution plan. So if it's still a solution plan then responsibility will indeed move. In fact you take some some, some two, two, two uh, operators that are actions out, which are inverse, then some of the things that they may, may have uh, uh, achieved have to be achieved by something else beforehand, yes. So it will automatically do that, and it's because it's we've got the proof that the plan still remains a plan, and it, it will do that, yes. Okay. How about investigating ways where you've learned that you've got some redundancies in the plan and feeding that back into the planner itself so it just doesn't create the redundancies. Have you looked at that? No, because th th that, <laughs> that goes against the idea of this black box is the planner, you see. So we tried to say you can put, you know, any from a set of planners in, on, and you can have maintenance, you can put a new planner in. So, so we, we, we consider that outside the scope. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, it probably is. It's, it's not within the scope of what we're looking at, which is just sort of having a plan of slotted in, and this, this helps speed up, uh, uh, sorry, helps give a, a more um, uh, optimal plans. So besides uh, the removal of, of uh, redundancy 
and improving efficiency, um, this looks like something that could be very useful when you try to generalize from examples and create plans that, that are, um, can solve multiple cases like we do in generalized planning. And in that case, some um, random uh, choices of a planner when you solve this simple example, uh, for example, doing, you know, ah, putting on yeah. first the, the yeah. left, you know, okay. shoe and then the right one and so on, yeah. could uh, yeah. prevent from generalizing because you, yeah. you, 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 you yeah. don't, you trace both of yeah. them and you want to be able yeah. to create loops and so on. Yeah. And I think that these kind, in that context, yeah. you may want to switch even actions with actions that have the same cost, but they create an ability to generalize and they match better the general plan. Okay, okay, so that'll be, yeah, yeah, okay. That's, that's an interesting idea, right, thanks. Okay, so, so this uh, notion of um, actions that you, uh, the idea of actions that you can make iterations by swapping them around, right, looks quite similar to the idea of the order, so creating a partial order. I mean, it's like you're getting rid of some of the unnecessary serialization in a plan that was in fact to have <coughs> partial orders. Uh, yeah. And in particular, in, in this particular example, it fails where also the ordering would fail because you have these sequential Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you know there's it, like Yeah, I, I, I reckon there is, and uh, I'll set that as an exercise to everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's the, the way this is formulated. Then I think there's a lot of uh, analysis that could go on and, and look into to, uh, relationships between other stuff and that. Uh, but but the reason that we don't explicitly do that is it's the the, 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 the swapping is really to to to, to get rid of two uh, actions that may well be uh, swapped out and replaced by a single one. It's, it's, motivation. Great, okay. thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we can move to the last talk given by Christian Muse and it'll be about optimally relaxing partial replants with Maxa. So I want to say first off, uh, at the end of the first half, it's still 0-0, zero, zero, so nobody has to leave yet. There'll be a break before the second half starts. Hopefully, we'll finish up before that goes between Portugal and Spain. And secondly, thank you very much for the last two questions, which lead very, very nicely into uh, the work that I'm about to present now. So my name is Christian Muse. Uh, this is work done with my co-supervisors, uh, Sheila Nakarth and Chris Beck. And we optimally relax partial order plans uh, by using Maxat. And if you realize that a sequential plan is just a special case of a partial order plan, then you see we can optimally relax sequential plans as well. So a little bit of motivation here. Um, for me personally, it's generalizing plans that uh, was motivating the reason I wanted to optimally relax two partial order plans. So first up, the, the partial order plans have a very appealing least commitment nature, and this is what we want to get at with them. On the other hand, uh, partial order planners themselves have not been very efficient uh, compared to the heuristic search ones as of late. And finally, MaxAt solvers have become increasingly powerful. So here's the big question. Can we use a sequential planner to generate a plan and then use a SAT solver, a MaxAt solver, uh, to turn that plan into an optimal partial order plan? And we'll see what optimality means in a little bit. So the overall approach is we're going to generate our sequential plan. We use FF for this, but any uh, sequential planner would work. We then encode the problem of finding an optimal pop as a MaxSat problem, and then feed it to a MaxSat solver and extract our solution. All right. So that's the overall approach. And if you want to just see one slide and ignore it to the end, the results are great, uh, at least for what we need it for. We want to maximize the linearizations, which gives us a more general partial order plan. And this approach really does give us uh, 10 to the 35 number of linearizations. It really does help improve the generality of the plan that we're after. So uh, the outline for the talk, I'll go through some background, describe what we mean by least commitment and optimality, uh, describe the encoding, and then some empirical results. So I'll blow through a lot of this background. The slides are meant for a general audience as well as the planning community, but everything here should be standard, so I'll go pretty quickly for this section. Uh, we're in a strips world, uh, the FOIG usual, uh, finite set of fluence, operators, initial state, goal state, everything is standard here. Uh, 
A state S is a subset of the fluence. If it's a complete state, we have the closed world assumption, so everything else is assumed to be false. A partial state, we don't have that assumption. Uh, every operator is a set of preconditions, add effects, delete effects, and these are a subset of the fluence. Nothing new here, and an instance of an operator is an action, uh, and there may be many corresponding actions for a single operator in our plan. Uh, and again, an action is executable in a state if its preconditions hold, or if the, the set of fluence in its precondition are a subset of the state S, and we update the state accordingly. All of this is stuff that you guys have seen. Sequential plan is a sequence of our actions. Now, partial order plans, I'll go through this a little bit, but thankfully some of the, uh, the material has been reviewed before. In the previous talk, we have a set of actions uh, and ordering constraints over those actions. And so it's not necessarily a sequence of all the actions, but a partial ordering over them. Uh, we'll also have things called causal links, and this is really just describing the reason why there may be a link between action A3 and A4 here. P2 is the, the fluence that A3 provides. Uh, and as with the previous talk, we include these initial state action and goal action simply to try and keep things complete and sound and so on. So we'll have a special goal action with the precondition of all of the goal fluence and uh, similar with the initial state. Uh, so formally, uh, set of actions, ordering constraints, and causal links, we'll use all of these to discuss the rest of uh, the approach. So a little bit more terminology. A linearization is a total ordering of our pop, and uh, this ordering has to respect the ordering constraints O. Uh, a threat is, uh, was brought up uh, in the previous talk. So for a causal, a causal link between two actions, A1 adding uh, predicate F for A2, we say that A1 supports the precondition F of A2 and the precondition is supported. And now, a precondition for some action is an open precondition if it's not supported. And finally, a threat occurs if there's some other action that could delete it. So this came up in the previous talk where there could be some action that's ordered in between them that will delete the fluent that you need. Uh, so for the pop example, we have a number of different linearizations for this pop that we have. Uh, possibly G2 is in the delete of A1, which could threaten A4 here achieving the goal. So this is why we might add an ordering constraint in between them. Right. So this is just a, a recap on partial order planning. Now, validity in partial order planning, there's usually two notions that will come along with it. One is that every linearization works, but if you have 10 to the 35 linearizations, this can be a little hard to ver verify. Uh, so the one we typically use is threat and support validity. So if there's no open preconditions in your pop, and no causal link is threatened, and you've included these dummy actions, then it's valid. So this is what we'll uh, be using. So again, quickly, through the satisfiability background that we'll need, uh, SAT is just a, you know, a set of clauses, uh, disjunctions, conjunctions, negations, you have your literals, and you need to satisfy at least one in every clause. I don't know if you can see the red there. Uh, now, if we move to maximum satisfiability, you need to satisfy as many clauses as you possibly can. And so in here, we can satisfy five of the six clauses, but there's no way that will get you all six. Now, if we go one step further, weighted max at, we can satisfy four of the clauses here, but you see they have weights on top, so the actual optimal solution is to satisfy three of them and get a score of five. So that's maximum sat. And finally, partial weighted max at, you have some hard clauses that you need to satisfy infinite weight, and the rest are soft. And so the optimal solution here would be to uh, set Z and satisfy all your hard clauses. All right, so on to the least commitment criteria. It's quite simple. There's two notions that have been studied previously, deordering and reordering. So from our sequential plan, you can deorder by removing ordering constraints, or you can reorder by adding a new ordering constraint that didn't exist before. That's the opposite of something that was there before. So these are two notions, and finding an optimal deordering or reordering is computationally difficult, and that's that's why we're actually throwing it to a maxat solver and not trying to do it heuristically. Uh, we're trying to see if we can actually come to the optimal value here. Now, one further thing that uh, we want to go a, a little bit further than just deordering and reordering, which keeps the same set of actions, is to first reduce the number of actions in your plan and subsequently minimize the number of ordering constraints. So we want to incorporate this notion that you don't necessarily want to execute all of the actions, like in the previous talk, but we also want to minimize the ordering constraints. So we first minimize actions, then subsequently minimize ordering constraints. So this is our notion of optimality that we're after. And the formal details, uh, you can check out the paper, but it's, it's just a, a very simple notion of minimizing one than the other. So our encoding for this, we have 
uh, different parts. I'll give the core encoding first, then show some extensions on how we would get the different uh, variations. We have three types of variables. One that's true if the action is in your final partial order plan. Another is the ordering between two actions, and so this variable will hold if AI comes before AJ. And finally, one that captures support. So if AI is to support AJ with the fluent P, then this variable is going to hold in our encoding. And so the set of basic clauses for this, we need to rule out any self loops, and we do this by just simply negating this kappa clause here. Uh, we need to include both of the initial action and the goal action, so we simply add them as unit clauses. If the ordering is used, then we also want to include the actions. And so, very simple constraint to ensure that that happens. If we include an action, it must become after the initial state and before the goal. Again, a, a very simple implication. And finally, enforce the transitive closure. So this may set off some red flags. This is the key bottleneck for our approach, a jump to the, the future results, but this is the, the nasty one here. And so the key core clauses, the, the hard constraints that really make uh, the solution a partial order plan are these two. First of all, we need to ensure that if we do include an action, then every one of its preconditions must be satisfied, so no open preconditions. We do this by saying, if you include the action in your final plan, for every one of its preconditions, at least one of the things that add to that precondition needs to be ordered before it and needs to be the support. Right? So this is just saying at least one of the achievers of every one of an action's preconditions needs to be included. Uh, the second one is that we ensure that if uh, we do have this supporter variable, then there's no threatening action that can be ordered in between. So we need to eliminate all of the threats. And this is done with this clause. So if AI supports AJ with fluent P, it means that everything that could potentially delete it, if it is in our pop, it needs to be ordered before or after the two actions. So this is analogous to promotion and demotion in the partial order planning literature. Uh, finally, we have soft clauses, and this lets us uh, minimize first the number of actions and subsequently minimize the number of ordering constraints. And we do one after the other by including uh, a very high weight for the number of actions, a sufficiently high weight. Uh, so I won't spend time on the extensions here because we're running low on time, but it's very simple to enforce that you include all of your actions or enforce that you have a deordering. And so this gives us a number of notions that we want to consider in the evaluation. One is a minimum deordering, and we include some of these extensions, uh, minimum reordering, and finally a least commitment pop, which minimizes the actions and then the ordering constraints. So again, our approach, we generate a sequential plan, encode the problem to find either a minimum deordering, reordering, or least commitment pop, and then use a maxSAT solver, SAT4j, to compute our solution. Uh, so I first want to say in the empirical evaluation here, there is this relaxer algorithm. The details aren't that important, but it's a polynomial time algorithm that tries to heuristically relax the ordering constraints. And so this was uh, due to Kemp and Ketter in 1994, and we'll include this in the results because uh, there's some interesting stuff that comes out of it. Now the encoding difficulty, we did have some problem on some of the domains. These are the number of problems, those that FF solved, and the ones we could successfully encode. And if we could not encode it, it's simply because there's far too many transitive closure constraints. Uh, you have n cubed number of constraints for the transitive closure, where n is the number of actions, and it's just way too large. So that's the bottleneck at the moment. Uh, now if we just look at the time, we have time axis across the, uh, across the, the x-axis here and up the number of problems solved given that amount of time. Uh, what we would expect to see is what happens. You know, the polynomial time algorithm is able to solve all of them fairly quickly. Uh, and then it comes down to the minimum deordering, least commitment pop, and minimum reordering being pretty much the same. Uh, but I mean, for our work, uh, the majority of problems, we were able to get a decent solution after 10 seconds or 100 seconds. Now this is to optimality, and of course these are maxSAT solvers that will give you suboptimal things that you could cut it off early and take that solution and run with it. Uh, now the pop quality measured in the number of actions or ordering constraints. Uh, we note here that the, the three approaches, uh, the polynomial algorithm, deordering and reordering, will have the same number of actions, but the ordering constraints different. And I just want to point out a few things. We do... Uh, uh, have the ability to uh, reduce the number of actions in some of the domains. Uh, in the other domains, uh, you wouldn't see a difference in the ordering constraints. Uh, but what's of real interest here is the relaxer algorithm, a polynomial time algorithm that's not guaranteed to find an optimal solution, actually does 100% of the time. 
So Relaxer was able to find the minimum deordering in every problem that we threw at it from the benchmark set, which was quite surprising. Uh, and finally, the reordering flexibility. Can we actually get an improvement and improve the linearizations if we forget about deordering and actually say you're allowed to reorder the actions in your original plan? And this is about 40% of the problems we did notice a difference in the linearizations, and it's up to a million times difference, uh, the ratio between the number of linearizations in the minimum reordering versus the minimum deordering. So a substantial increase, and so there is benefit to going towards the minimum reordering. So finally, to conclude, uh, we've introduced a practical method for computing optimal deordering and reordering of plants, which was previously just stated to be uh, too hard computationally to even uh, attempt. Uh, we've proposed an extension to lease commitment planning that will minimize the actions for us and discovered that a previously introduced polynomial algorithm finds uh, quite often the optimal deordering, so if that's what you're after, uh, use the polynomial time algorithm for that and uh, finally found that we can achieve a greater flexibility if we do go for the minimum reordering over the deordering itself. So we would like to try different techniques to compute the optimal plans. The transitive closure being our bottleneck, we would like to use an external reasoner to try and deal with the transitive closure clauses that are in here. And finally incorporate preferences and different optimization criteria into this encoding. Uh, so for example, you can minimize the number of initial state fluence that is required for your plan to achieve the goal. Might be good for conformant planners and so on. Uh, and so if you'd like to see the slides, the papers, and the code, you can uh, visit the website. Everything's up there now. Thanks. So we have time for questions. Yeah, so ultimately for generalizing, um, we generalize a partial order. Not all of the states are covered. Uh, we found a correlation between the number of linearizations and the amount of states that you can cover with the policy that's generalized from there. So uh, it's just, there's a loose correlation between the number of ordering constraints, inverse correlation between the number of ordering constraints and linearizations, and then a correlation between the linearizations and the generality of the policy that you get. Yeah. I, I mean, ultimately, we would want to maximize the policy strength, but we have to inadvertently do that by minimizing ordering constraints. Other questions? How long ago was there any relationship between the way that the plans have been produced and the effectiveness of relaxer in this, this situation? I wonder whether if you looked at plans produced by You certainly do get different kinds of results. LPG would usually start with uh, a lot more uh, actions included in the plan. It's usually a, a quicker solution that's more rough around the edges, and so you do get more actions and more opportunity to optimize there. Um, the types of plans that are produced and are fed into this is an interesting question, and we did uh, try to see if SAT plan fed into this approach and POPF fed into this approach and FF. And would there be a difference between these as initial uh, plans? And there wasn't any. After you generalize it to its optimal uh, relaxed state, they all seem to be pretty much the same across the board. There's no uh, statistical significant difference between them. Yeah. And relaxer is still finding the optimal deordering. Yeah. Yeah. Which was quite surprising. And uh, I, I, sh I should say relaxer is, there's counterexamples where a relaxer will not find a minimal deordering even. It will just find a deordering that's not even close to optimal, but uh, those counterexamples don't appear to be in the IPC benchmarks. Yeah. Other questions? If not, thank you. <laughs> okay, so this is the end of the session, and I welcome you all to the ITSCAPS uh, results at 5 o'clock, I guess it's here. Thank you. <laughs>